Uh, Rick was right yesterday when he said that Paul uh, never thanks anyone, but he thanks God for them. In, in that spirit, there's a couple folks I want to mention that I thank God for. And, and the first is, uh, I thank God for Frank and his family and the saints here at Clear Springs Bible Church for the, the honor, the privilege of being able to speak to you this weekend. Uh, it's a great honor. I know there was a tremendous amount of effort in making this conference go so well. When things go really smoothly, it's evidence of tremendous work. So I congratulate you on that, and I appreciate the honor of being here. Um, you, you, know, you know, you've heard this saying in football, the quarterback gets too much of the credit. And um, what I would say is, for someone to stand up here, a lot of other things have to happen. So I, I want to acknowledge that I'm deeply indebted to the saints at Columbus Bible Church because there's a bunch of men there that are equipped and dedicated that allow me to do things like this. And if it wasn't for them taking on that work and doing it, frankly, I wouldn't be here. Um, so I'm, I'm indebted to them, and they've covered a lot of things on my behalf in the last year, and so I just mentioned that. Uh, one of the joys of the ministry is to be around other saints that are capable and can help you do things, so I, I thank God for them. And then I should be extra uh, sensitive and, and conscious about saying this. Uh, I, I appreciate Stephanie. Um, they say that behind every good man there's a great woman. I don't know if I'm a good man, <laughs> but I know she's a great woman. And uh, without her, none of the things that, that we do would be possible. Our ministry wouldn't be possible. So I acknowledge those debts. They're real. They're significant. Um, they deserve a ton of credit for allowing some of the things that we do to happen. So I just wanted to say that. Um, let's go ahead and dig in then. Let me um, open us in a quick word of prayer. Lord, thank you for this time. May we use it productively. May you be glorified in all that we do. It's in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ that we pray. Amen. We started by looking at 1 Corinthians 15, 58, and we decided to focus on abounding in the work of the Lord. We then saw that there are three big distractions that keep us from abounding in the work, and we, then we started looking at the three things that we should do as saints to respond to those distractions. But I feel like there's one thing I failed to cover that, that I want to mention, and that's this. Before you get to the issue of abounding in the work of the Lord, you need to make sure you're in a position where you can do that. And what I mean by that is you have to make sure you're saved. The reality of life, here's what's going on in this world. There is so much deception. There is so much confusion about the gospel that there are literally millions of churched people that are faithful. They attend their church. They read the Bible. But they do not have a correct understanding of the gospel. And so they are in the worst of all worlds. They are unsaved, but believe they are in good standing with God. So let me just be clear and brief on this. The gospel is Christ died for our sins, was buried, and rose again the third day. The moment you believe that, that you trust that, apart from any works, apart from any religious works, apart from keeping the commandments, apart from getting water baptized, apart from living by the golden rule, the moment that you have faith alone in Christ alone, you're saved by grace alone. And if you get rid of any of those alones, because what we do is we like to add stuff to it, Right? If you get rid of any of those, God's grace ceases to operate. Take a look at what Romans 11:6 6 says when you have, say, have some time. It, it, we're saved by grace, and if by grace, then is it no more of works, otherwise grace is no more grace. But if it be of works, then is it no more grace, otherwise work is no more work. In other words, grace and works are opposites. They are incompatible. You have to choose. You either are saved 100% by works which can't be, for all have sinned to come short of the glory of God. So the only option is you're saved 100% by grace. It's a free gift, and we just have to believe it. So please settle that. I'd be happy to talk to anyone afterwards. But that, that is by far the greatest issue in life. And so please settle that. All right, let's talk about then getting busy with the work. So if you have your charts at the bottom, the second thing that, that we as believers need to do to respond to the distractions of the world is to get busy with the work. Turn with me, if you would, to Ephesians chapter 4, verse 12. Brother Rick touched on this yesterday. I want to say just a couple things. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 12. For the perfecting of the saints for the work of the ministry for the edifying of the body of Christ. 
Now let's talk just a moment about what it means to be a perfected saint. I, I've had confusion about this in my mind for years. I I've often think about the word perfect as if you get back your math test, if you get 100% it's perfect, if you get a 99% it's not. And so when I thought about the perfecting of the saints, I thought, well, who am I kidding? <laughs> I'm never going to be a perfected saint, right? Well, let me read to you. Uh, there's two definitions of the word perfect. The first is finished, complete, consummate, not defective. And that's not how the word is being used here. <coughs> it's the idea there of having no defects whatsoever. But the second definition is this. Fully informed, completely skilled as men perfect in the use of arms. And the idea here of what's going on in this verse is that what we need to be is we need to be fully informed so that we can then do the work. I'm sure some of you have heard this saying, measure once, measure once, cut twice, measure twice, cut once. Yeah. Are any of you familiar with that? I think that's the story of my home improvement endeavors, <laughs> right? Where what happens is you think you got it right, you cut the board, it's now just a little too short, and Home Depot is happy to see you again, right? Because you can't do any job without going back at least once or twice. Well, the point is, if you're about to set out to do some serious work, should you measure more than once? Should you be sure that what you are about to do is what you should be doing? And, and you should. Now, the reason I mention that, this is an enormous problem in Christendom. There are enormous ministries that have thousands of people that have million dollar budgets and they are doing something that God is not doing. Amen. Right? Their whole ministry is devoted to a gospel that God's not preaching. And so all that effort, all that striving, all that money, all that time is wasted. Will God change what He is doing today simply because we haven't paid attention to His Word? No. no. So what we need to do is we need to be perfected saints in that we need to be fully informed as to what God is, is doing. And then the purpose for that according to Ephesians 4.12 is to do the work of the ministry. What that means is this. The work of the ministry is not solely behind there. The work of the ministry is every one of us in the places that we live and work and the people we know doing the work of the ministry. Let me put it this way. As you think about your circle of friends, relatives, co-workers, how many in those circles are saved, they understand the importance of the King James Bible, and they're established in Pauline doctrine? You know what that means? You are the most important person in many ways in their life. And what I mean by that is you are, you are the person that has the opportunity to give them the truth. Right? Can you just sit back and say, well, I'll just wait. Someone else will take care of it. No, if you understand these things, what that means is you have the opportunity to do the work of the ministry. We have, we have a, we're blessed to have a prison ministry, and I tell those men all the time, listen, you're blessed. God has a purpose that He's accomplishing with you. I know you're not happy to be here. You didn't want to go away to prison. But if you going away to prison resulted in you getting saved, and you getting established in Pauline truth, so that your eternal destiny is different, and you can now tell other people about that, your eternity just changed. Your life now has a purpose. And that's true for all of us here as well. Look at me in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 10. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 10. But by the grace of God I am what I am, and His grace which was, which was bestowed upon me was not in vain. Now notice this carefully. But I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. When Paul's talking here about himself in relation to the Twelve, Paul doesn't say, I was more articulate, I did a better job preaching. What does he say? He labored more. He worked harder. When Ephesians 4.12 called it the work of the ministry, guess what the ministry is? Work. It's work, isn't it? Yes, sir. 
it's work to put on a conference. What, you know, just candidly, you know, what, what preaching is, is I, I, may be, I was curious if others uh, agree with this or disagree with this, but what happens is, as, as, as preaching or leading assembly, what happens is you have a million little jobs that no one knows about, but that just have to get done for things to function, right? And as you do ministry, whether it's that or personal work or whatever it is, there's lots of things that you just have to do. And that's okay. That's a good thing. But what I'm saying is ministry is work. So I think people sometimes have the idea that it's emotion, right? In other words, we had someone once, they showed up to our assembly. They, they visited. At the end of it, they said, I'm never coming back here. So you're curious, right? Why? What is it? Sounds like a ringing endorsement. You got to tell me more. <laughs> And, you know, the Spirit of God's not there. What's he saying? Well, listen, yeah, if there's even one saved person in the room, the Spirit of God's there, right? But what he's saying is his flesh didn't get excited about what was going on, so the Spirit of God wasn't there. Go with me 1 Corinthians 16. When Paul says he labored more abundantly, the fact is Paul engaged in incredible labors. 1 Corinthians 16, verse 15. I beseech you, brethren, you know the house of Stephanus, that it is the first fruits of Achaia. Now notice this, and that they have addicted themselves to the ministry of the saints. Now we often think of the word addiction in a negative way, and that's what it normally is today. But here there are apparently people that were addicted to the ministry of the saints. That tells you two things. Number one, how much time do they spend in the ministry? An awful lot, right? They were addicted to it. They just kept spending more and more and more. And the other thing I think it tells us, it's pleasurable. If you're addicted to something, what's happening is you're finding some pleasure in it or else you wouldn't keep doing it. Well, the reality of the work of the ministry is, although it's work, it's extremely rewarding work. Amen. So here's, here's what I would suggest to you, and, and I, I don't know how you react to this, but I'll just tell you. One of the things to deal with the distractions of the world is work yourself so hard that you don't have time to sin. When you have free time, can you figure out something you can do to advance the ministry? Can you read the Bible more? Can you figure out something else to do for your church? And, and what I, you know, I'm just telling you what happens is our normal reaction is, I don't have to, someone else can do it, right? Remember, we looked at this a little bit yesterday in Titus 1.12, our flesh wants to be a slow belly. I can sit back, someone will take care of it, I already do a lot, right? Are there a lot of reasons we can come up with as to why we shouldn't do more? We can, and we can convince ourselves of that, but I will tell you is the work of the ministry is rewarding. Everything you do for the Lord is profitable, and we're going to look more at that in just a minute. But what I would suggest to you is what we ought to do is we ought to become addicts to the ministry. People sometimes talk about Christian burnout, and the idea of that is you work people too hard, you work them too hard, and they get burned out. They just get overwhelmed. My opinion of that, I don't think that saints burn out. I think that they dry up. And what I mean by that is it's not the work that's the problem, it's they dry up because they get estranged from the source of life, which is Jesus Christ. And I was, I'm not saying that he gets mad at them or they get mad at him, but what happens is they drift apart from this book, yeah. and their life just becomes th themselves and what they're doing. The work of the ministry won't hurt you. It's good for you. It's beneficial. So I think the thing that we need to do is we need to get busy with the work. The third thing is to get into the book. And we're going to spend a lot of time on this one. I tend to think this one is the most important. You can reach whatever conclusion you want about that. Get Galatians 5. Galatians chapter 5, verse 16. Galatians chapter 5, 16. This I say then, walk in the Spirit, 
and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Now, if you remember, one of the first distractions we looked at, the first one was the lust of the flesh. So we don't want to fulfill the lust of the flesh. This verse tells us the answer. What do we have to do? We have to walk in the Spirit. If we walk in the Spirit, we will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. If we are fulfilling the lust of the flesh, guess what we're not doing? We're not walking in the Spirit. So that's simple, that's easy. But let me just dig a little deeper with you if I could. What exactly does it mean to walk in the Spirit? When I've heard people talk about this in the past, one thing that's sometimes said, well, what happens is, instead of me doing it, it's God doing it. Let go and let God, is what people sometimes say. And I'll just be honest with you, I don't understand what that means. And my observation over the years is when someone gives you a vague explanation, what they're doing, is they don't know the answer, but they want you to think they know the answer, and so they gave you this thing that you don't understand, and I don't think they understand, but that's the explanation. Well, that's not adequate, is it? We need to know better than that. Look with me at Romans 8. Romans chapter 8. Verse 5, for they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Now what I'll tell you that verses 5 and 6 seem to be saying there is that if we're going to walk after the Spirit, what we have to do is we have to mind the things of the Spirit. Richard touched on this yesterday. The issues of life, are they external or are they internal? They're internal. See, our problem is not external circumstances. Our problem is internal. It's the stuff we take with us because it's inside us. Look with me at 2 Corinthians 10. Second Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. So it's saying here, we walk in the flesh, but we don't war that way. Notice what verse 5 says. Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. That tells you the issues of life are in our mind. What are we supposed to do with imaginations? Cast them down. Isn't that what it says? Here's my observation. You've probably heard folks say this. As we teach children, as we get them toys, we have to get ones that really stimulate their imagination. Have you ever heard that? I hear that all the time. And we, we need to get them to use their imagination. What does Genesis 6-5 tell you about man's imagination? Evil and wicked continually. The imagination of man's heart is only evil continually. Right? See, the stuff that emphasizes man's imagination stems out of the, the, the naive, incorrect view. Man's heart is good. Yeah, we have a few flaws here and there, but our hearts are good. No! It's the exact opposite. It's, it, it's out of the, the, the evil of our hearts that everything else proceeds. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. Now, my point in verse 5 is simply this. Let me read it one more time. Casting down imaginations, that means we're taking control of our thought life. And every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God. There are things in your mind that will exalt themselves against the knowledge of God. Let me give you an example with a distraction. Have you ever been reading, you know, let's just say a mystery or, or some interesting book, and you can't put it down, and so you read it till 3 in the morning? We've all had that experience, I think. 
Well, I'm going to suggest to you that's something that interferes with the knowledge of God. And here's why. This is my opinion. You know, you know maybe this is extreme. Maybe this is crazy. This is my, my opinion. There are so many, only so many hours in the day. Every hour we spend reading something that is not God's Word prevents us from spending that hour in God's Word. Right? So I'll give an example that's timely. We just recently voted in Ohio. So in order to vote, I think this was right, I had to spend some time getting informed. Right? I don't want to cast an ignorant ballot. I want to do something intelligent. And so what happens is I start reading. And then what happens when you start doing that? Well, here's another article, and here's another thing I can link to. And you know what happens? Very easily, and this is, I think this starts from what is, I think, an okay, a good thing to do. It's better to do things based upon being informed than not being informed. So it starts out in a good place, I think, or in a legitimate place, let's say that. But what is it easy for my mind to do? To get caught up in that stuff. Right? And then I can learn more and more, and I can spend more and more time learning about the things of the world. And the bottom line at the end of the day, there's only so many hours in the week. Amen. Right? So every hour I spend learning about that stuff, and maybe some amount of time in that is okay, but there quickly becomes a point where this is no longer a productive endeavor. And what happens, what I think what 2 Corinthians 10 tells us, is we have to be very vigilant in our minds. I need to not trust my mind to always do the right thing, and I need to guard it and I need to instruct it as to what it should be doing. Notice the end of it. And bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. There's no time, there's no instance where you punched someone where you didn't beforehand in your mind decide to punch them. Right? Every sin you do is preceded by a decision to do it and typically preceded by an analysis of the consequences. Right? Before you do the sin you, you work through, well, how much profit, how much benefit am I going to get from this sin? How likely am I to be caught? We go through all that. Listen, every one of those thoughts is evil. Right? And that's why we have to take captivity every thought we have. Because what happens as soon as we let ourselves go down that line, we're putting ourselves into a pattern of evil thinking and it's going to go to a bad place. <laughs> That's why the essence of walking in the Spirit is being spiritually minded. It's not stopping my fist after I've already decided to punch someone. It's stopping my mind before I start going down that mental path. Look with me at Colossians 1. Colossians chapter 1, verse 9. For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to desire that ye might be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that ye might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work, and notice this, and increasing in the knowledge of God. Paul's prayer there was for their increasing in the knowledge of God. Which means this, we never arrive. You're going to do one of two things. As you go through your walk, there's no time where you reach a point where you're like, okay, I'm good. I'm just going to put on the cruise control and I'm going to get through the rest of life because I know what I need to know. That's not the way that it works. You're either increasing in the knowledge of God, which is spiritually healthy, you're growing, or if you're not doing that, what are you doing? Decreasing. You're decreasing, you're declining. My, my point being that what, what's incumbent upon us as saints is we need to be consistent, we need to be continually increasing in the knowledge of God. That means we need to be continually studying, we need to be continually reading. Look with me at Ephesians 4. The saint cannot rest on his laurels and be spiritual. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 17. We're going to read a number of verses here. As we do, notice how many of these verses tell us 
that our walk is based upon our mind. Ephesians 4.17, This I say therefore and testify in the Lord, that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk, in the vanity of their mind. The way the typical person on the, on the earth walks is they walk in the vanity of their mind. Their mind is emptiness. Uh, it, it's puffed up and useless. Why do they walk in the vanity of their mind? Verse 18, having the understanding darkened. The problem is there are some things they don't understand. Being alienated from the life of God through the notice this, the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart. So in verse 17 we know that the, the Gentiles have vanity of their mind. Their understanding is darkened in verse 18. Verse 18 also tells us that there's ignorance in them. Verse 19, who being past feeling have given themselves over unto lasciviousness to work all uncleanness with greediness. greediness. Verse 20, but ye have not so learned Christ. The learning of Christ there again is the mind. Verse 21, if so be that ye have heard him and have been taught by him, again that's the mind as the truth is in Jesus, that ye put off concerning the former conversation the old man, which is corrupt according to deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. So the being renewed is in the spirit of your mind. Here's what this all means. I can just sort of sum it up. The <laughs> I was trying to pretend it wasn't happening, but <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, you don't go so far. Yeah, this is hard. So, here's what Ephesians 4 is really telling us. If we're going to walk the way God wants us to walk, it's going to be based upon our mental state. <laughs> it's a distraction. <laughs> You know, this is funny. This is exactly what happens. You think for weeks and months, what's the perfect illustration? And you're never as good as real life. <laughs> real life is so much better. Isn't that something? <laughs> so here, here's what we need to take from this, I think. As we're thinking about our walk, it is based upon what is in our mind. Meaning, we have to spend time concentrating, de deciding, studying to get the right things in our mind. <laughs> Turn with me, if you would, to Romans 12. By the way, this tells you why that simply moving to a new place or taking a new job doesn't solve the issues of life, because the issues of life are internal. Romans 12, verse 2. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. The way that our lives are transformed is by the renewing of our mind. So let me make a, a contrast here before we move on. Do you remember how Jesus Christ refers to people as whited sepulchers? He says, outwardly they're beautiful. But what are they inwardly? Dead men's bones is right. Now here's why that matters. I'm going to suggest to you that this is what happens. What most fundamental religion does is once they get you in, what they want to do is they want to polish that exterior really nicely. Here's the clothes you should wear. Here's how you should talk. Here's how we present ourselves. Here's the places we go. Here's the places we don't go. And if you follow those set of exterior rules, they'll look at you and say, look how spiritual he is. Look how much he's cleaned up his act. He used to show up wearing this, that, and the other, and now he looks better. 
But what Ephesians 4, what it told us is what actually happens is the issues of life are internal and then come out. See, if we polish the outside, all we've done is make a hypocrite, right? But if you actually really want to change someone, if you want to change someone in a way where the change endures, even if you remove the external pressure, you change it from the inside out. Because what fundamental religion does is it gets people to look that way when they're in circles where those people see them. That's right. When they're not there, when they don't think they're going to bump into them, that's not how they are. Because the change was never internal. The change was never in who they are. It was just in what they look like. And if we're going to change who we are, we're going to have to change how we think. And the only thing that can do that is God's Word. Get with me, 2 Timothy 2. So what this tells us about walking in the Spirit is that walking in the Spirit, in its essence, is being spiritually minded. That's what it is. That means our thinking patterns have to change. And I'll tell you what that really means, is that means our time spent in the Word of God has to change. So 2 Timothy chapter 2 Look at verses 3 through 6. Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. And if a man also strive for masteries, yet is he not crowned, except he strive lawfully. The man striving for masteries there, I think, is an athlete. Verse 6. The husbandman that laboreth must be first partaker of the fruits. So there's three examples that are used there that are given to Timothy. There's the soldier, the athlete, and the husbandman. And I want to think with you just for a moment about what those verses are telling us. I'm going to suggest to you that the most important part of a soldier's work is training. So when someone's first brought into the army, where do they go? Boot camp, basic training. And they spend hours and hours and hours teaching them, this is how you shoot your weapon. And then they practice it, because they want to become marksmen. And they teach them, this is how you disassemble your weapon. This is how you reassemble it. This is how you, they even teach them how to salute, right? And what happens is, th they teach them, they teach them, they teach them, they practice, because what happens when you get into real battle? You want those things to be instinctive. You want them to be ingrained so that when all the chaos occurs, you have been so adequately prepared that you can function effectively. It would be irresponsible to bring people in the military and send them to do something without adequate training. The key, the, the key there is preparation. The second illustration Paul uses was that of an athlete. All right, so here's a question. In a pro football game, how much of the 60 minutes, so you watch a pro football game, it's a little bit over three hours, 60 minutes of game time, how much of that time is actual live play? 11 minutes. So think about what goes on. How many hours do people prepare for those 11 minutes? They lift weights all off season, right? They spend during the week learning the game plan. Here's what athletics is. I believe this is the case. Someone could disagree with me. What athletics is, if you're going to be a good athlete, you prepare, you prepare, you prepare, you train, and then your actual performance is a brief moment of time. Amen. Isn't that right? right. The thing that's, that's the starkest contrast, the, the thing that makes that clearest in my mind at least, uh, is watching the Olympics. Right, which again, I don't suggest you do. It's a distraction. But think about like, I don't know, figure skating. They have this little three minute performance, right? And the Olympics only comes along once every four years. And people spend years and years and years preparing. And they're going to be judged on what? Three minutes of performance. The key to being a successful athlete is preparation. The third example Paul uses, the husbandman. What does the husbandman do? The husbandman is 100% about preparation. If you want to bring in a crop, what's the fundamental thing you have to do? You have to plant it. You have to tend to it. You have to take care of it. Get with me Galatians 6 if you would. Galatians 6. 
Galatians 6 verse 8, For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption, but he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. What that tells us is, if you want to reap, what do you have to do? Work. You have to do work, right? Well-doing, 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 well-doing. Finally, you get to the due season and you reap. Here's what I'm getting at. People sometimes have the idea that what spirituality is, is God gives them a zap, right? I get a second blessing and now I'm spiritual. That's the exact opposite of what it is. The way that you're spiritual is your mind has to be changed, but you're not changed because you read a couple verses and something mystical happens. You're changed because what happens is you read the Word of God, you read the Word of God, you read the Word of God, and then years later you find yourself being able to quote it because you're, it has become part of you. Right? And what Paul's saying there to Timothy is, Timothy, in order to do the job that you're supposed to do, you're going to have to work and work and prepare and prepare and prepare. Now, sometimes that offends us because, you know, here's, I'll give you an example. Have you seen these commercials for eight minute abs? They're great, right? You take a video, you put it in for eight minutes, right? And you do four sit ups and you look like the Incredible Hulk. <laughs> Does real life work that way? No, it doesn't. There's no such thing as eight-minute abs. It's not the way that it works. One of the things that Richard used this illustration, I think, in GSP, uh, the, the question was, uh, there was a, someone that was presenting uh, at the school, and he said, how to preach for an hour on 10 minutes preparation? And the answer, if I get it right, was preach for 50 years. So in other words, if you want to be good at preaching, if you want to be skilled in that, what should you do? Preach and preach and preach. If you want to be an effective Bible teacher, what do you need to do? Study, 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 study. And what happens is we want shortcuts because we're lazy. But what I'm suggesting to you is that just the way that this works, if we're going to be spiritually minded, it's going to be because our lives have been transformed by the renewing of our mind. And the renewing of our mind only happens by one thing. It is this book. And we need to spend more time in it. The distractions of this world keep us from it. And that is why our lives don't change. Amen. It's on us. We're not spending our time the way we should. Get with me Acts 17, 11. <coughs> Romans talks about their thoughts, meanwhile, else accusing or excusing one another. What that tells us is we're awfully, awfully good at the business of rationalization. We have lots of reasons why. Well, I didn't because of this, or that, or the other. But at the end of the day, those things are just lame. Look at Acts 17.11. <laughs> These were more noble than those in Thessalonica, in that they received the word with all readiness of mind, and searched the Scriptures, here's the key word, daily, whether those things were so. They were in the book every day. Job 23, 12, I'm going to read this to you quickly. Neither have I gone back from the commandment of his lips. I have esteemed the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. How many of us have had the experience of, I just didn't eat the last three days. I got really busy. <laughs> right? I, had, I was busy at work. I had a lot on my calendar. So, you know, I just didn't eat for three or four days. If we're candid, that doesn't happen to us, does it? We figure out a way to cram into our schedule a way to eat. Amen. But are there periods of two or three days, maybe even a little longer, where we don't find the time to read God's Word? And what Job said is that this is more, necess more important than his necessary food. See, we, we, we have to make this a priority, and we don't. Psalm 119.11, Thy word have I hid in mine heart, that I might not sin against thee. This book helps prevent sin. 
If we want to avoid the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, we have to get it into our mind so that it changes us. I'll be completely honest with you, maybe I'm wrong about this, I'm wrong about an awful lot of things, but if you see sin having any sort of place in your life, you know what it tells you? This book doesn't have a big enough place. Amen. Right? And you need to, we need to look at our schedules, and we need to figure out, make some decisions. Here's some things I'm not going to do, because I need to have more time in this book. That's what we need to be doing. Let me give you an example. Now, this is not as good as the example of the car horn that's honking, but this is the one that I thought of. <sighs> We've all had the experience. You're driving somewhere. There's an accident on the side of the road, right? So traffic gets backed up for miles. Why does it get backed up for miles? Yep, everyone has to slow down and look. Now, the folks that slow down, they never get out of their car and go over and try to help fix the problem, do they? They ever get out and try to fix the cars? They ever get out and try to render first aid? No, no. You know what it is? The eye is not satisfied with seeing. They drive by, ooh, something must have happened here. I need to see this wreck. I'm not certain some of that isn't morbid where we just want to see whatever catastrophe happened. Now, think about that just for a moment. You know what happened? Every one of those drivers that got in their car, they got in with a purpose to go somewhere. They didn't go, typically, I mean, it's like, unless it's like the ambulance, they didn't get in their car with a purpose to go see that wreck. They were going somewhere else. Often they were going somewhere important. But what, what, what happened to them? They got distracted. Here's, oh, this is interesting. This is more important than me getting to work for sure, right? and it turns their attention away. They started with a purpose, but they got distracted. If you think about what 2 Timothy 3.10 says, what Paul says, thou hast fully known, he says, first thing important, my doctrine. Then he says, my manner of life, and then he said, purpose. And what I'll suggest to you is this, if you're saved, which I hope you all are, the rest of your life is about, do I fulfill the purpose God has for my life as a saint? That's the only unknown. It's, it's not unknown as to whether you're blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. It's not unknown whether you're complete in Christ. It's not unknown whether you're sealed under the day of redemption. I mean, we can go down that list. There's dozens of things that are true about you that cannot change. The one thing that's in your control that's unknown is, What's the rest of your earthly life going to live like? I'm going to restate that because I don't think that was English. <laughs> what is the rest of your earthly life going to be? Are you going to use your time in a productive way that glorifies the Lord Jesus Christ? Or are we going to be distracted by things that charm us, that, that grab our attention? We need to be serious about our purpose. Two more verses and I'll close. Get Isaiah 55 and then 1 Corinthians 15. Isaiah 55. Isaiah 55 and verse 11. So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. That verse is a great comfort to me. As you do the work of the ministry, do you often feel inadequate? Do you often feel, I'm not equipped to do the things I need to do? If I talk to these folks, if I teach them, I'll mess it up. And, and I think, for honest, we, we all have those concerns from time to time. What Isaiah 55, 11 says is God's Word is so powerful that if you just present it, it's going to do exactly what He wants, right? It's not going to return unto Him void. May some people reject it? Yes, but His Word didn't return unto Him void. It accomplished exactly what He wanted. 
right? Those men were presented with the truth. They're accountable for how they reacted to it. God's Word does not return void. It accomplishes the purpose for which He sent it. Get with me 1 Corinthians 15. First Corinthians 15, 58. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. That's what we need to be doing. Here's why. For as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. So if you take those two verses we just looked at, what it told us, God's Word doesn't return void. It accomplishes that which He sent it to do. His Word will get done what, what God wants. And your labor in the Lord is never in vain. I've told some of you this. When we were first starting in Columbus, there were times I'd be up teaching, and I'd look out at the audience, and I'm pretty good at math, and I'd say, there are more people in this room with my last name than not. <laughs> and the reason I was good at math is there wasn't a very big number, right? It wasn't hard to figure that out. And so you ask yourself the question, what am I doing? <laughs> Is this just some ego thing where I'm here because I like the sound of my own voice? And if I'm going to just talk to people named Reed, I can do that at home, can't I? But what so my point is, sometimes you may feel like we're not accomplishing anything. When preachers talk to other preachers, what's the first question? How many you got? How many you got, right? <laughs> The church we were part of in Beaver Creek, down the road, there was a, there was a furrows, which is it's like a Home Depot. The furrows moved out, and there's this massive building they actually had to onto, and a charismatic church went in there. And what you know what everyone thinks? Well, there's a Grace Church here. They meet in this small room in what used to be a small carryout, and there's a church just down the road that meets essentially in a warehouse. Which one's God's blessing? Well, God has to be blessing that one. They've got the bigger building, right? They've got more people. And it's easy at times, <clears throat> if we're not thinking clearly, to just look at the external, to look at the visible, and say, what am I accomplishing? What are we doing here? But what these verses tell us is that when you are laboring in the Lord, it is not in vain. It cannot be in vain. Amen. When you're doing what God wants you to do, leave the results to Him. Amen. That's His problem. We just need to keep doing the work. Amen. Let me give you this example. The financial markets this year have been all sorts of turmoil, right? They're all, they're all over the place. And interest rates are really low. And what this means is that investors are struggling to find something to invest in because the rates of return are so bad. Now, you know what they'd love? If there was an investment where they would be guaranteed to double their money in a year, they'd just love it, right? They'd jump into it. They'd put everything they have into it. Based upon those verses, we were just told and guaranteed by God Himself that any investment we make in His Word is an eternal investment with an incredible rate of return. It's beyond this world. Amen. I mean, isn't that what those verses says? God's Word is going to accomplish what He sent it to do. Our labor in the Lord is not in vain. And the reason why these distractions of the world are such a problem is what we end up doing is there's only so many hours in the day. And we spend a lot of time on things for which the eternal rate of return is Zero. Zero. Whereas the time we spend in the book, the time we spend dealing with the souls of men, the rate of return there is infinite. Let me put it this way. On this earth, there's only two things you deal with that are eternal. Right? Everything you can see is going to burn. There's only two things that are eternal. That's the Word of God and the souls of men. Right. 
And if we're spending time in anything else, it's wasted time. Now listen, we got you got to earn a living. I, I get that. If the car's broke, you got to fix it. But what I'm talking about is let's cut to the chase. What we do with the discretionary time we have is we don't invest it very well. Because the things of this world are attractive to us. They're enticing. And we're drawn away into them, and they consume our time. And the, the, the profit we get from that eternally is nothing. And so what we need to do, friends, is we need to say no to those distractions. We need to flee those lusts. We need to get busy with the work, and we need to get in the book. What I'm going to suggest to you, and I'll close with this, at any given moment, most of the body of Christ is absent without leave. Right? Amen. Are we in the midst of a war? According to Ephesians, we are. And what happens is we're dilly-dallying around down here with all sorts of stuff that doesn't mean anything. Right? And we need to be busy about the Lord's work. And the Lord's work, by the way, it's rewarding. It's exciting. Is there anything more exciting than when you can see in someone the Word of God change them? You ever see someone believe the gospel and their life's just different? You ever see someone get hold of a truth and it just changes who they are? That's so valuable. We need to be spending our time there to make those things happen. Amen. Amen. Father, thank you for this time. Thank you for your word. Thank you that you have not only saved us from hell by what your son did, but that you've given us an eternal purpose for this earthly life. Help us, Lord, to use the moments we have for your glory. Help us to av avoid the distractions of this world. Help us to flee them. And help us to spend our time getting in your word and doing the work of the ministry that you would have us to do. It's in, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. Amen.